Good day, Charles. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you, Guy, and, and thank you for the invitation. Well, you're most welcome. I've had you on my list for uh, quite a while here, and I'm just uh, kind of catching up to my backlog. Um, I have a multi-question uh, uh, front end on this to kind of introduce you to provide some of your earliest background. So for our audience, uh, could you please introduce yourself, tell us your name, and then tell us where you grew up? So my name is Charles Jennings, and I'm I'm an Australian. Uh, I was born and grew up in the outback in Australia. My family had a, a sheep and cattle station, so I grew up with 25,000 sheep and 1,000 cattle. We were about 100 miles from the nearest big town and 100 miles from the nearest secondary school and really 100 miles from just about anything. So at the age of eight, I went to boarding school, which was 250 miles away because there wasn't anything much closer. And I've moved a long way since those early years, that's for sure. Well, thank you. So can you tell us about uh, uh, where you are right now? Uh, right now, I live in the beautiful city of Winchester in England, uh, although I still have a house in Australia and, and also a cottage on the west coast of Scotland. But uh, yeah, I live in, in Winchester, which is the old ancient Roman capital of Britain. Oh, thank you. So where did you go to university and what did you study? Uh, well, that's, a, that's a, uh, another long story, I guess. I, I first, after I left school in Sydney, I went to the University of Sydney. I studied natural science, sciences. I did a four-year degree there. After that, I did an applied sciences master's degree at the University of New South Wales, which is also in Sydney. Following that, I came to the UK and started a PhD at the University of Dundee in Scotland that I didn't complete because we ran basically ran out of funding uh, for the, that I needed for the research I was doing. So I worked for a bit and then I completed another, another master's degree in education at the University of Southampton in England. So I think uh, in all, I spent about 10 years at university and that's not counting the time I spent later on when I was working in a business school as a researcher and then as a professor in the business school. So yeah, so I've seen the insides of a lot of universities. <laughs> well, thank you again for that. So uh, can you uh, take us through your career progression? Because I think that's very interesting. So at what point in the in the uh, schooling did you shift into, you know, a paying job? And, and can you walk us through those jobs and perhaps maybe some of the more interesting projects that you were engaged in? Yeah, sure. I think actually, if I roll right back to my first my first studies at the University of Sydney, and because they they really gave me a key set of experiences, which molded my whole thinking about learning and performance. Actually, because when I did my first year in the School of Biological Sciences at Sydney University, uh, I was sort of quite intrigued because they'd had to automate everything because of the nature of the number of students they had to deal with. And there had been a surge of students because it was during the Vietnam War and Australians were drafted. And the only way that you could you could defer the draft was if you were at full time study. So they had a real spike in terms of university entrance. And so my first year in the School of Biological Science, I never saw a student. I never saw a lecturer. Uh, all the all the lecturing was done by TV. At the beginning of the year, you got a, a, a schedule in terms of when the sessions would be run, you turned up into one of the lecture, in one of the lecture theatres, there were big TVs hanging from the ceilings. And you, if you had any particular uh, questions, you could post them in the faculty office. And then on a Friday, the lecture appeared live. Of course, you know, it was 1968. Uh, as I said, the Vietnam War was on, but you know, it was, it was uh, um, that, that era, you know, no one, studied much, everyone had a great time. So, you know, you never saw saw a, uh, uh, a lecturer. And then I went back as a tutor four years later and started working in the School of Biological Sciences just for a year and was involved in converting all the laboratory work into uh, a just-in-time, uh, uh, learner-centric uh, work, uh, which was all self-paced learning. So I think that right at that early stage, I was exposed to doing things differently in terms of, of learning. And so 
since then, I've been out and I worked, as I mentioned, I was uh, I was a professor in a business school uh, for quite a long time here in the UK. I was headed up the, the UK National Centre for Network Based Learning, which was set up by, by the UK government back in the early 80s after the first PCs appeared. And uh, we was involved in some very, very interesting initiatives around online collaborative learning, particularly in a near market academic research, for example, in 1984, uh, my team launched the first multilingual online collaborative programs across Europe in involving organizations in France, Germany, and the UK. And the, the technology at the time was sort of cocoa tins and bits of string, really. But we did a lot of, lot of work around that. Then, then 10 years later in 94, I launched or headed up the launch of the world first pure online MBA. And we got all sorts of awards for doing doing that. So I have had a really interesting interesting ride, uh, not just in academia, but but outside. But but in academia, I also spent a, quite a lot of time working in Eastern Europe. I worked uh, at the uh, University of, of Western Hungary and Sombatai in Western Hungary, where I was involved in computer aided language learning programs. I worked in the Ukraine at the Center for Cybernetics in Kiev. Uh, and I spent time at the, at the Institute of Science in Moscow, and I was a month in the University of Havana. So I had lots of exposure to different uh, cultures and the way different things were done. Uh, and that, I think, really formed the way I, I saw the world in terms of how do we help people you know, do their jobs better, basically. And so I had initially quite a, uh, quite a deep and long uh, exposure in academic life. And then in 95, I was uh, offered a job I couldn't refuse working for Dow Jones Markets, the financial uh, side of, of Dow Jones Corporation, before my fellow Australian Rupert Murdoch got his grubby little hands on it. But uh, I spent some, did some really interesting work there. Uh, I found, found it was really interesting working in, in a, an organisation that, that dealt with data that was dealing in fast moving, fast moving world. So that's sort of my early experience straight out of university into then working absolutely solidly with feet grounded in learning and performance. Well, can you share with us a little bit about uh, what you're doing now and uh, you know, the, the kinds of work that you do, the kinds of customers and markets that you serve? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm doing a number of things now. I've, I've had my own consulting company for the last, well, goodness knows how long. Uh, and after uh, an eight year stint as chief learning officer at Reuters, I came back to doing consulting work, working with mainly large organizations, helping them uh, move from learning mindsets to performance mindsets, helping them thinking about their strategies in terms of how they can help uh, their organizations become more inventive, more innovative, and respond more rapidly to change. And I've always said that, you know, my, my role, I've always seen it as helping organizations and people you know, do their jobs better uh, and improve this this creating this culture of continuous improvement which incidentally I much prefer to use that term rather than the the term learning culture which I often think there's a missing word in there when people talk about creating a learning culture what they're really talking about is creating a culture of formal learning whereas if you think about and talk about creating a culture of continuous improvement you're moving you're moving the the line of sight from learning into performance and getting that change of mindset from a learning mindset to a performance mindset you know is, is a big challenge as you as you know guy you know but that's that's something that i feel very passionate about and have spent uh you know the last 20 or 30 years of my life focusing on well thank you and and that's why i wanted to have you in this series but that's a good segue perhaps into my next question which is um, the, my series is HPT videos, and uh, it's about human performance technology, also known as human performance improvement, also known in the decades in the past as performance technology, or just simply performance improvement. Um, but so I'm not sure if you had any exposure to the National Society for Performance Improvement and, and all of those things, NSPI, which is now ISPI, which is kind of where this all started. But then ASTD embraced this as well and put their own kind of spin on this. But 
Can you share with us any of your first exposure um, and, and and also how do you refer to this when you talk with your clients? And I think you already kind of answered that question, but uh, so what was your first entree into this world? Yeah, absolutely. I think from your second point there, how I refer to it, I, I like, to re like to refer to it as really as performance-based improvement, performance-based learning, because it's I see that the challenge as being more than just human performance because it's a, a systemic problem, which is a mix of how do you help organizational performance improve when human performance is part of the mix? So I, I see it as, as performance-based learning. In fact, the work we do at the 702010 Institute in, in Tulsa is all focused around performance-based learning, which is a sort of a mashup between uh, HBI and a 702010, a sort of a workplace learning approach. But my first, uh, in terms of exposure uh, to HBI and similar approaches, uh, I'd read uh, Gary Rummler and Alan Brash's Improving Performance book right back in the in the late or the mid 90s when I, I left academia and I was uh, started to work at, at Dow Jones Market and I was presented with what was seen as a training problem, but in fact was a problem with information and knowledge flows. And so uh, I'd taken the job at Dow Jones Markets and, and my job, my title was strategic technology director. And I think people thought that uh, for the transactions bit of the business, I think people thought that uh, I was going to come in and, and apply technology to learning and, and improving people. Uh, and I'd, I'd done work with interactive video and various other technology based learning uh, approaches in the past. And, and I was thrown this, this project uh, to, to help the sales team uh, improve their performance, in other words, improve their sales. And it was presented to me as a training problem. And uh, so I did, uh, you know, as I say, I, I'd read uh, uh, Rummel and Brash's book and I had been exposed to H HBI. So I, I did a good piece of what I thought was a good piece of performance consulting around that and realized pretty early on that the problem was nothing to do with uh, or couldn't be solved by training. It needed uh, other things in place. And in fact, what we ended up building was essentially a, a mix between uh, a KM system and a performance support system in order to support uh, the training people because they had problems such as if, if a, a Dow Jones Markets salesperson was going to talk to a potential client, maybe it was a Bank of America in Hong Kong. They had no way of knowing if anyone in Dow Jones Markets had been involved with, with Bank of America or in Hong Kong or in a particular, their particular area before. So there was just lack of, of knowledge there. So uh, I, I came across HPI there. Uh, and, and I'd also been exposed to the thinking of people like uh, Deming, uh, Edwards Deming, and some pretty influential macroeconomists as well. Uh, Kenneth Arrow is a, a great example. And, and Kenneth Arrow, you know, once wrote that the learning is the product of experience and that learning can only take place through an attempt to solve a problem, therefore only takes play, place during activity. And so I'd been exposed to all, all that. And I think that my exposure to to HPI just reinforced my, my sort of core belief that if we're looking to improve performance, we have to take on a totally new mindset to the mindset of formal learning, of training. And, and I guess that's what's driven me. I'd also met people like, I'd spent time with people like Harold, Harold Stolovich and Erica Keats and Victoria Masik, and who are all involved in that informal learning uh, early on. And I'd worked with Jay Cross for a number of years. And uh, you know, Jay's work was all around informal learning, but what he called real learning. So I think that uh, you know, building on that, I I really where it really grounded me in in thinking about, you know, how can we use or how can we approach the issues of performance through a much wider lens, essentially. And of course, again, I, you know, I, I was also aware of the work of, of Tom Gilbert's performance engineering. And, and so all of those sort of fed in, I guess, to my, my approach and my thinking about the, the interaction between the, the performer and the environment was really critical. And that, that we tend to forget about the environment in lots of, of learning focused work that's done. 
the environment piece is sort of put to one side. So basically, that's that's you know how how I came to it. Well, thank you for that. So we we've kind of overlapped with my next question, which was some of your earliest influences, and you've named a lot of names there. So. So is there any, are there any other people that you might recommend to our audience from, from your earliest, because we're going to get later on into uh, people uh, more current, but uh, any articles or books in particular that you might point people to? Uh, I don't know if there's people. Certainly, I have two colleagues, uh, two Dutch colleagues, Jos Aritz and Vivian Heinen. Now, they've been working with uh, HPI and had trained in the U.S. and so on. Uh, and, and run a business based around HPI for years and years. And uh, we got together in the, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I guess. Uh, and uh, ultimately, Jos, with the help of Vivian and me, wrote a book describing a new methodology or a methodology which is really has HPI at its heart, but is extends into this designer performance-based solutions rather than HBI. And then let's look at the formal learning solutions that we can deliver from that. So it's sort of extended. And that book is a sort of, as I said, it's a mashup between the 70-20-10 approach and HBI. And uh, it's it's called 70-20-10 towards 100% performance. And that was really critical. So I think that uh, those those two folks, Jos Aritz and Vivian Heinen, are really... Uh, important, along with people like uh, Gloria Geary and so on, of course, uh, who had significant influence in the performance, uh, in the whole performance area. Yes, thank you. Well, let me shift gears here a bit on you. And uh, uh, this is to provide an example to our audience. But if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech about what you do, and I normally set this up saying you're at a, a garden party, and some new neighbor comes up and, and asks you and says, Charles, what do you do? What would your answer be in a 30 second elevator or lift mode? Okay. What I do is I try to help organizations and the people in those organizations to do their work better. It's as simple as that. What I mean is that it's not just about helping average performers become exemplary performers. It's about actually greasing the wheels of the organization to help improve outputs, you know, to become more agile, to become more uh, innovative, to increase the levels of, of invention and to respond fa to change faster. And that involves a lot more than just fixing the people. And I think that uh, in my 30, in the 30 second elevator pitch, I would say that uh, there's no point just fixing the people if you don't look at the, take the bigger picture in, into, into scope, because you can fix the people and unless you change the environment and make sure, you know, it's the old story about, you know, if you take people out and put them back into the same environment uh, and expect them to do different things, you know, it, it's a similar madness, really. So basically what I do is I help organizations and the people in them to do their work better. Thank you. Uh, let me switch gears again here. As, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what's your current focus or next focus is for learning? And are you doing any writing or videos or anything about that that people can access? Yeah, Guy, at the moment, I'm particularly interested in a couple of areas. One is the whole, what I would call the skills obsession. Uh, in fact, I recently published a paper with a, a, a man called David Broadhurst who runs a, a business focused on helping working really in safety in, in industrial areas uh, for safety. And uh, we wrote a discussion paper, which is called Performance Beyond the Skills Obsession. And, and that's with a subtitle of what high performing organizations do that others don't. And in that, we looked at issues such as the gap between work as described and work as performed, because one of the major challenges that we have in terms of helping improve performance uh, is that most learning professionals often don't understand how work's carried out by top performers because the work is described in standard operating procedures and described by the managers when you talk to the managers is actually quite often different when you observe an exemplary performer or high performer carrying out that work. You know, so, so they don't necessarily follow the standard operating procedures and yet huge amounts of time and effort is spent 
on training up people on standard operating procedures. But when you observe top performers, you'll say, well, why didn't you follow that? Why didn't you do this? And they'll have a good reason, but there's no two-way flow of information. So, you know, the exemplary performers don't see it as their responsibility to flow to provide that information back into the organization. So that's one area that I'm really interested in. And also that ties very closely into safe work and safe working and, and, and helps us think about how do we focus on replicating what goes right rather than just identifying what goes wrong and fixing it. So that's, a, that's one area I'm particularly interested in. And the other area, which is, I guess, a lot less sexy is compliance. And it ties into safe working and, and into uh, psychological safety and so on. But you know, all the evidence that I've read over the years seems to indicate that compliance training has often marginal impact in terms of compliant behavior. And people like Jeff Kaplan, you know, who's a lawyer, who's really an expert in this area, has, has uh, written a lot around this. And I think that, uh, and there's been a lot of work around diversity training. In fact, Peter Brigman published an article a few years ago in Harvard Business Review, uh, showing that for carrying, based on a meta study carried out over 31 years, I think, showing that uh, the diversity training has a net, ne uh, basically no impact, and in some cases has a negative impact in terms of, of behaviors around diversity. So that whole area really interests me uh, because I think there's a lot of work to be done there, first of all. And secondly, when we look at the amount of time, effort and money spent on compliance training, uh, if we're not doing it right, you know, everyone loses out. And it is a huge drag and a huge cost, cost for organisations. So I'm doing some work in those two areas, particularly at the moment. I haven't written a book. I'm thinking a book about this, but I'm I'm thinking about the the whole area around the skills issue because you know, like many many people, I've been involved in in mapping competency frameworks and aligning skills frames work, works with those competency frameworks, and then identifying uh, you know uh, professional skills and and building uh, curricula and things based around that. I've come to I've come to see, I've come to understand that actually that. That stuff is very heavy in terms of workload, and often the change is ongoing all the time, and really its impact is is minor, you know. And and I think that people in in my profession uh, have just spent a lot of time being tied up with this stuff without taking a step back and say, hey, do we really need to do this? Is this adding value? How are we going to how are we going to really improve? The performance of the people and the performance of organizations in some other ways. I mean, I think that I look back at Gloria Geary and think of the work that she did. You know, we're talking about 30 years ago now. And, you know, the whole area of performance support is still seen as marginal to most learning and development people. And that, that just astounds me. Yeah, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, back on my first day on the job, back in August of 1979, I was given in 1970 newsletter from Rumler and Gilbert, and they talked about guidance, which was more popularly known at that time than uh, uh, nine years later as job aids. And yeah. this has been something that's been around for a long, long time, but it just doesn't get traction. And in fact, in my first job, my new boss told me that that's what we were going to do. We were not going not gonna to provide training. We were going to provide guidance, which we would call job aids. And our clients hated it. So we ended up having to embed job aids into the training to make the client happy, to give the performers, the learners, what they needed to perform back on the job because too much of what we were providing to people were things that were going to go into what we called cold storage. Um, they wouldn't be used for a while. And uh, by the time the person needed it, you know, they weren't going to be able to, to sure. recall yeah. that. And so it's, it's, but it is a huge thing. And mm -hmm. it's just a shame that, all the emphasis that I've seen over the decades on job aids, performance support, electronic performance support systems, et cetera, uh, maybe nowadays it's going to become uh, more of a focus because the technology enables that. Uh, at least I would hope so. I, I've, I've believed I this my whole career. Yeah, I would hope so as well, Guy, but I, I'm not so 
you know, I don't feel so positive about it. If I can just tell you a, a quick story. When I, was sure. chief learning, when I was chief learning officer at Reuters, the company was rolling out a new CRM system. So I, I, I sat down with the, the program manager and, and said, to, said to him, look, uh, you want my team to travel around the world training people on this new CRM system. Uh, and in some cases, just think of the logistics. You know, they're going to be trained. They're going to be trained six weeks before they, you know, come face to face with this new system. We know that as new systems are being prepared for deployment, things change. So we may even be training them on things which, you know, in processes and so on, which are not going to, and not going to be applicable to the system. So I've been working with an Australian perform, uh, performance support company, what they call business guidance, business process guidance. So it was basically embedded embedded job aids, embedded help and support in the system. And uh, we'd had some great success with this, with our customer order management group, we'd actually increased their productivity by 20% in the first month of operation. So I knew it worked. And so uh, this program manager, we sat down and talked about it and said, yeah, he said, yeah, this looks like a good idea, let's go for it. So he and I presented to the, the board that was overseeing the implementation of this new CRM system. And uh, we gave a short presentation explaining, you know, giving some background and some research and some evidence to support it. And uh, the first question we got was one of the board members who said, OK, Charles, that's great. But what's going to happen or how is the training going to be done after this happens? So the mindset was simply that if you didn't train because they had a, they had a training line in the budget. So this is a multi-million dollar uh, project and there was a training line in the budget. And he felt that had to be done. So that had to be ticked off and, and didn't just didn't get the fact that this was going to replace the need to train people. Because in the mindset of many people is that if you don't train people, people can't do. And I think that's a major, major problem that we have. I, I agree with you. It's our customers who have uh, predetermined uh, what training is going to look like. And it's more of an educational model than a training model, in my view. But uh, yeah, they they're, they are the inhibitors of us moving forward with this. And uh, it's hard to turn their minds around unless they have some firsthand experience or people that really trust, that they really trust, tell them differently. And I've seen the battles in project uh, steering team meetings where master performers who helped guide us in developing uh, job aids and performance support went to battle with project steering team members several layers up in the management chain about whether this was a good idea or not. So it's, yeah, certainly got its controversy and we've got a long way to go. I don't think that the it's going to be smooth sailing uh, often to see this this kind of a change. No, and it comes right back to the point I made, I think, about you know having a performance mindset and a learning mindset. And I often go back to George Bernard Shaw, you know, the great Irish poly, polymath, until recently the only, only person to have won both a Nobel Prize and an Oscar, until Bob Dylan did the same just a few years ago. But Shaw once said that progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. So if you're looking at, at working on in terms of getting to do things differently, you really have to spend some time thinking about how you can help people change their minds. Because some of this, this, this education mindset is so inbuilt into our thinking. And, and Jay Cross often used to say, you know, he'd say, well, actually, the problem we've got is people can't separate learning from schooling. You know, because we think about learning, we think about automatically our brains go into a schooling model. And, and we've got a lot of work to do in, in, in that whole area of helping to improve performance. And we've got the technology and the technology is emerging all the time to help people. I mean, you know, you and I have heard this many, many times. But if I want to want to learn how to go and fix a washing machine, I don't do a course on washing machine fixing. You know, you and I know what we do. And so we do that in other parts of our lives. But when we put our professional hats on and go into work, we often go back into that schooling mindset. And that, I think, is a major, major barrier that we need to overcome. And to be honest, Guy, I think one of the major walls and barriers against this is the thinking of many learning and development professionals themselves, because they are really schooling professionals. You know, they're providing, as you, as you say, education. 
And education is great. Uh, and, you know, let, let me not knock education. But if you're trying to improve performance, educating people away from the context of work is, is never going to do it. it. It might help, but it's never going to be enough. I, I so agree. I so agree. Well, let me shift gears again here one more time. And uh, my next question has to do with our language. Our language has always been messy. When I first entered, people were complaining about uh, the language used in uh, training and development or instruction and that, that's carried over into the learning and development world. But is there a performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you just want to put your own spin on it. What would you have for us? Yeah, and, and I'd sort of like to take a little side road here. I think, I think the term workplace learning or learning in the flow of work, those phrases, I think they, what they should mean and what they often mean are two different things. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, for me, workplace learning is when we learn from what happens in the workplace. You know, coming back to, to Kenneth Arrow, you know, learning is a product of experience. So workplace learning occurs when we actually embed learning in the workflow. You know, we're talking about job aids, we're talking about performance support or whatever it happens to be. That is workplace learning, when learning or support is built into the workflow. And we also extract learning from, from working. So for me, workplace learning is about extracting and embedding. When I, what I mean by extracting is when we take some time back to, to reflect, when we talk with our colleagues and say, hey, that worked well or that didn't work well. We won't do that again or we will do that again. That sort of learning. And for many of our colleagues, I think workplace learning is missing a word. They really think about how do we inject formal learning into the workplace? In other words, how can we make that e-learning more and more granular so that we can call it micro learning, which for me has no meaning because it's, you know, learning is a process and, and you don't have a bit of micro learning, you have a bit of micro training. Uh, but it's so I think that workplace learning often just means adding learning into the workplace for many people. So if I were to, uh, if I would like to, to define, I, well, I suppose I've just defined that difference. And I'd, I'd like to think that people can come and see the difference between adding learning into work, which, you know, may be great, may help. And also what workplace learning is, which is using the workplace and understanding that actually the research at the, at the Center for, uh, for Education and the Labor Market in the Netherlands has identified that about 25% of the work that knowledge workers do are opportunities for learning. About 20% of the work that blue collar workers do are opportunities for learning. So the amount of time we spend learning is actually far exceeds the time we have for any sort of formal learning. So once you start to help people think differently about that, the way in which they will refer to workplace learning or learning in the flow of work might actually change. Uh, and the sort of solutions that we develop to help them might change as well. Yes, I agree. Thank you for that. Let me shift gears here one more time with another question about the people or books or articles that have influenced you more lately. So if you were to point our audience to people that are active today in the field um, or in indirect fields, but uh, related, who might you point them to? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, apart from your good self guy, of course, uh, people like like the work that Bob Mosher and, and Con Gonfrenson are doing in their five need, moments of need approach, uh, which is, again, is rooted in the whole idea of, of embedding learning as part of work and utilizing uh, learning as a, as, a, as a tool for performance. That's, uh, they're, they're two people that I think uh, uh, who influence me at the moment. I would point others to. And, and I mentioned my colleague Jos has been working with HBI for years and continually innovates by developing novel solutions based on, on good evidence base. And his L&D business models, uh, which are focused on moving, moving uh, learning and development professionals from being what we call order takers into where they're producing learning focused solutions, you know, with no analysis, no, 
no performance analysis, maybe a bit of learning analysis, but that's it, into being uh, value creators. In other words, focusing on, on the performance needs and how we develop solutions based around performance needs. So uh, I think that's a big and create value. That's a big, a big step. Then there are other good thinkers and, and practitioners in this space, such as I think Harold Jarke with his PKM model, personal knowledge management model, and his focus on, on team-based activity and learning and communities of practice and sense-making and social networks. So I see Harold's work as being quite important in this area. And uh, another, another person who doesn't live far from me here is a guy called Dave Snowden, who was with IBM for many years. And Dave, with his Kinevin framework uh, for managing complexity and performance improvement, I think that, again, gives a totally different and, and novel approach to the whole area of human performance. So, you know, I could go on and on, but, uh, but I won't. But uh, there are quite a few people, I think, working in, in parallel areas where there's a lot of overlap between the work they're doing and the whole area of human performance improvement, whether it be through the lens of HBI, HBT, or whether it be through the lens of performance-based learning or whatever lens we're looking at, but how we're we helping organizations you know, respond rapidly and, and continue uh, to survive more than anything else. I so agree, and those are good names that you've mentioned. Uh, Charles, again, thank you so much for agreeing to participate with me in this interview, but I have a final question for you. Do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for people that are primarily new to the field? What would your words of wisdom be for them? Well, I think I've, I've said a few times during this conversation, uh, I don't know whether they're words of wisdom, but a bit of advice, I'd say not to get tied up with learning too much, especially with individual learning. I, I don't think many of us achieve the outcomes we need to achieve alone. Uh, we tend to work in teams and multiple teams. And if we're simply focusing on individuals and individual skills and capability building, I think we're missing a, a big trick here. We're really just looking through a very, very narrow lens of what is quite a complex and wide picture. And if we're going to help organizations innovate and push the envelope, achieve better outcomes, you know, the individual is really a bit player in this and the performer, you know, the performer, if we call the individual's performers, they play a part, but the system is really the key bit and there are lots of elements in the system. So my advice would be, I guess I come back to mindset, is adopt a performance mindset and not a learning mindset. And I mentioned Shaw's, uh, Shaw's quote about uh, the fact that, you know, if you're going to change things, those that cannot change their minds can't change anything. And so one of the first things we need to do and in our professional field is think about how we pe help people change their, their minds. Because once we've started them on changing their minds, and I've seen it on projects I've worked on, Guy, I'm sure you've seen it many times. Once people sort of the light goes on and they say, ah, oh, maybe we could try this. And sometimes you try you know, small steps and you see that there is a different way of doing things. And uh, I've seen this within the 702010 Institute. We work with a big uh, Friesland Campina, the world's largest dairy cooperative. And they approached us with what they saw as a training problem. Their, one of their factories was having too many outages. They'd identified that about 25% of the outages was due to human error. So they came to us and said, would you help us train the operators? We went in, we did the analysis, we observed and, and uh, uh, talked with a lot of uh, a lot of people. We worked with the, the L&D team and produced a solution that was nothing about learning. They produced uh, an app which helped the flows through the, the factory. So when there was a blockage in one part of the factory, it could be picked up and, and, and dealt with and it didn't cause blockages further on. And, and, and basically that, that app, I think it cost about a thousand euros to develop. It took about 200 and 200 hours or so of learning and development professionals time. In the first week after it was rolled out, one factory reported the saving of about 50,000 US dollars. 
and those savings just went year went month on month on month and once they got to about a million dollars a uh, a million euros they said thank you very much but uh, that's because the reason that solution was developed because it was around a performance mindset rather than a learning mindset it would have been really easy to go in and train everyone would it have an effect maybe would it have had the effect that we had through really good performance analysis and then designing a solution based on performance improvement rather than based on learning, I, I doubt it, but I'm almost certain it wouldn't have. Thank you for that, uh, that example. That was great. Charles, again, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Um, I, I look forward to uh, following you uh, uh, some more on social media, and I'll be sure to put in the show notes uh, your various contact information, et cetera. But again, thank you so much. Well, Guy, thank you for the invitation. It's been a real pleasure. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.